Good evening, everyone. I'm meteorologist Dave Snyder with the National Weather Service. You're watching Alaska Weather on this 15th of October. As always, we encourage you to stay up to date with your local weather information, and you can do that easily by calling us on the Alaska Weather Information Line 1-800-472-0391. Find us online anytime at weather.gov slash Alaska, and if you can't find what you're looking for, please let me know. I'm happy to serve you any way I possibly can. David.Snyder at NOAA.gov is how you find me. Now, as we look at the hazardous weather across Alaska, it looks a lot different than the last couple of days. A lot of the really heavy snow and rainfalls kind of moved out of the region, but we're now focusing on winds from the remnants of Typhoon Hagibis. As you probably heard, the system's working through the western bearing. We have two areas of low pressure now, one of those just south of the Gulf of Anadir and another to the south and west of the Pribilovs. The Pribilovs will likely be looking at some high winds in the next 24 hours, probably starting overnight about 3 or 4 o'clock in the morning to about 1 o'clock in the afternoon tomorrow. Winds may gust as high as 80 miles per hour. And while that's not uh, a horribly bad system for the illusions or maybe the Pribilovs, it's always a good idea to maybe look around if you haven't had a strong wind in a while, pull in some of that loose stuff closer to the house, tie it down, move it inside, whatever you need to do to secure loose items there. And uh, again, uh, kind of lock things down just a little bit because for the next 24 hours, starting overnight tonight, you'll probably have some very strong winds moving through. So gust to 80 miles per hour and a high wind warning that'll start up around 4 o'clock in the morning and go until about 1 o'clock in the afternoon for your Wednesday. We're also watching for some heavier rainfall around southern parts of southeast. Uh, an advisory is painted in here. You can barely see it under the word Ketchikan, but flood advisory is posted specifically around Ward Lake. Uh, water's been coming up there, and it's not a, a heavy or a flash flood, uh, but it is noticeable, and uh, you've had, to, had a, a pretty decent period of some moderate to occasionally heavy rain in the region. That's really not expected to let up a whole lot in the next 24 hours, so more minor flooding could be possible there in the region. Uh, this is also a good time to remind you that even though we do have some localized flooding in the area, widespread, the drought issue is still upon us, so it's always a good idea to be uh, ready with the, uh, the water conservation efforts that are continuing in your region, if they still are. And uh, just remember that this is a long-term drought situation that we're pulling out of, very different than what was going on across south-central Alaska. Southeast, still moving away from drought conditions. So you can have flash flooding sometimes, uh, even in uh, a longer period of drought. And that's what's going on around Ketchikan, and specifically Ward Lake this afternoon. As we look at the satellite picture, you can see the remnants of Hagibis there working through the region. As you see that beautiful curl here on the satellite picture, it, does, it is producing some very strong winds. And all around the system, we are expecting to see storm force and hurricane force winds uh, developing out across the area as it moves across the southern Bering Sea in the next 24 hours. Uh, as you are looking at the marine weather with us here in just a few minutes following our break, you'll be able to see more of those impacts across coastal communities and some of the strong winds that are coming up and certainly some of the higher seas that are coming up. Uh, in fact, uh, we've uh, lost uh, communication from the anemometer uh, from our western Bering Sea buoy as a result of that. So uh, again, uh, we, we expect that it's correlated to the storm that's out there, but uh, not 100% sure until we go out and see the buoy, which could take some time. Uh, this curl indicates a, a very strong weather signature, uh, and it is literally pulling in the colder, drier air, wrapping this into its very tightly wound low-pressure center. Uh, out ahead of that, though, the weather's generally quiet. So we've got some areas of low pressure here closer to southeast. That's creating the rainfall. But for really most of the mainland, things are generally quiet. They should be generally clear as we go through the next couple of days. And so if you're trying to get through any of the passes, uh, north, south, east, or west, most part, you're probably going to be fairly pleased with the forecast coming up for the mainland. Uh, but as far as stormy conditions out west go, yeah, it's going to be rough and tumble for the Bering Sea for the next, uh, I'd say, uh, 24 to 48 hours at least there. And uh, gradually that will dampen out as it moves into a large part of the western Gulf of Alaska. Here's a look at the current weather map. 972 millibar low just south and east of Kodiak. It's got an occluded front up against the north and eastern Gulf Coast. Pockets of rainfall continue there, moderate to heavy at times around the Ketchikan area specifically. And then across the eastern Alaska Range, and especially north and east of the Alaska Range, we're finding enough cold air meeting up with moisture that's bleeding over from the Gulf Coast to get parts of the Copper River Basin with uh, areas of moderate snowfall. Paxson all the way down toward Gulf Canada, seeing some snow today. And then we've got this 
really tight area of fog around McGrath down to Sleep Mute and Stony River. You're likely seeing some uh, pretty murky weather there for today. And there could be some areas of fog here across the North Slope. We're seeing a lot of cold air stuck there with even a, a wave of low pressure moving from east to west. So the big news is what you see out there in the west, low pressure at 981 millibars as we get into tonight. That's going to combine uh, across the uh, south and eastern bearing at 970 millibars. Won't be surprised to see some convection with that, maybe some thunderstorms with that. So if you're out at sea, and hopefully you're not at this point, you're moving in safe harbor as that's going to be a very vicious night out there across the water. Uh, 970 millibar low bringing uh, hercs and storms across the southern Bering Sea, and then pockets of rain and snow mixing up across parts of south and west, and a couple inches are possible there. For south central, we expect to see some light rainfall around Prince William Sound, and then a much better chance of getting wet across parts of southeastern Alaska. You can see mainly dry weather, though, for most of the middle and upper Yukon, across the north slope, areas of fog and flurries. And by Wednesday, really a lot of that is, is holding off from moving into the Chukchi Coast across the middle Yukon. A lot of dry weather there and really north and west of the Alaska Range. You'll start to see more clouds wrapping in from east to west coming out of continental Canada. And then also areas of some light rain across parts of southeast. So while it won't be terribly heavy weather, it will be persistently wet weather in areas around Chilkoot and White Pass, likely seeing periods of rain and snow. And as colder air is drawn into uh, Haines specifically, uh, your snow level is probably going to come down as it has in recent days. Areas of low pressure across the central gulf and then this line of disturbed weather stretching all the way out into the Bering Sea is just to the north of the jet stream. As you'll see here in our aviation maps in just a minute, a ferocious jet is just south of the Aleutians and the north side of this is uh, helping to get, uh, is getting help from the jet stream and keeping that very elongated pattern of disturbed weather going. And again, with the remnants of uh, tropical or typhoon uh, Hagibis, uh, we can see there's still some pockets of convection there across the Alaska Peninsula as well. So an isolated thunderclap or two, but mainly showery type weather passing through as we get into your Wednesday. Here's a look at Thursday now, and again, you can see the settling of this elongated area of disturbed weather. Uh, as far as a main focus goes for an occluded front uh, where we'd see a little bit more active rainfall, probably be here across southern parts of southeast once again. Areas of showers across the north and western Gulf, including Kodiak, Bristol Bay, and then inland. As soon as you get into some of that cold air, precipitation kind of mixes in and changes over to rain and snow. For the higher terrain, that's all snow, and that includes showers of snow developing across the Alaska Range, but the interior, mostly okay. You'll have clouds around Fairbanks up to the north into some of the higher terrain there. Uh, some pockets of snow showers and a little bit of a brisk wind developing across the eastern Beaufort Sea coast here as the pressure gradient tightens up even as high pressure, very local high pressure system is trying to settle the winds down and trap in some moisture there across the north slope. It looks like there will be some wind developing here across the eastern Beaufort Sea coast as we get into Thursday and Friday. So disturbed weather in the south, cloudy in the east, clear and dry in the west and a little bit of wind shaping up for the north slope and rain continuing for southern parts of southeast as we get toward the end of the week. An awful lot going in just about every area of Alaska. Let's take a look at temperatures now. As you get into southeast, lower to mid 40s for southern southeast, mid to upper 30s for northern parts. Prince William Sound could go below freezing around Valdez, 29 there, about the same uh, for areas around Cook Inlet. Talkeetna only 25 in Healy tonight, 12 for Eagle. Looks like Arctic Village could drop to three below. The North Slope though, well, the temperature is closer to 30 degrees, a record high set in Utkiavik yesterday. 28 in Nome. Southwestern temperature is looking at in the mid to upper 30s. Southwest, 30s and 40s there. 37 around St. Paul, a high of 45 on Wednesday. For Southwest, most areas will hover in the upper 30s and lower 40s. Look for South Central temperatures to struggle to get out of the 30s tomorrow. Closer to 50 degrees for many parts of Southeast again, but it will be wet. 28 in Fort Yukon. 32 in Utkiavik, Kaktovik looking at 31, Nome 35. Overnight low temperatures Thursday morning, teens and 20s for the most part of the interior, 10 around Healy once again, 20s and 30s for southwest. Adak, Atka, you're looking at 40s, southeast, upper 30s and lower 40s, Kodiak 39, Ambler, 13, and Wainwright looking at 31 degrees, a high temperature there tomorrow of 37, Kaktovik 30, Arctic Village 24, looks like most areas in the upper Tanana Valley and the upper uh, Yukon probably in the lower 30s, lower 40s for most of South Central and Southeast holding close to 50. And now, aviation weather around Alaska. 
Moving on to aviation weather now, marginal conditions will be seen all the way across some of the southwest coastline of the Pribilofs and into the Alaska Peninsula there. This is all in advance and along a frontal boundary that's moving into southwestern Alaska for your Wednesday morning. From the Bering Straits south and west into some parts of interior southwest, expect to see marginal conditions there in the morning and also lower conditions around the Copper River Valley and parts of Mentasta Pass and the north and eastern Gulf. For most parts of southeast, watch for marginal conditions to start your day and as we get into the afternoon, you'll see not a whole lot of change as we get through uh, southeast weather uh, for your Wednesday. For most of the central and western Gulf, hit and miss marginal conditions, you'll really start to see that change around Kodiak Island as that front is moving closer to our southwestern capes in Bristol Bay. And watch out for convection here. There's a possibility for some showers, maybe an isolated thunderstorm, and this is all in advance and part of that system of uh, what's left of Typhoon Hagibis. Across Norton Sound all the way through the Bering Strait, again marginal conditions there. Not a whole lot of IFR to be found as we get into Wednesday and Thursday for that matter. Uh, the upper end of Tanita Pass and the upper Yukon Valley should expect to see hit and miss marginal conditions as well as areas around Tanita Pass. Most of your north slope conditions will be pretty good. The passes stay open through Thursday morning. Watching for the Beaufort Sea Coast and parts of the Chukchi to see marginal conditions by your Thursday morning. Not a big change for southeast as we get into your Thursday afternoon. Do watch out for lower conditions here across Chilkoot and White Pass, maybe as far as IFR concerns go uh, for Thursday morning. And the same goes for Mentasta Pass, a little bit lower as we start up your Thursday. For southwest, not a lot of change. Mostly marginal conditions all the way from St. Lawrence Island to St. Matthew, Nunavak, all the way down into uh, just north and east of King Cove and False Pass. By Thursday afternoon, uh, marginal conditions remain across southwest into the uh, exterior of Norton Sound, Nome into the Bering Strait communities in St. Lawrence Island. Areas around uh, the upper Yukon Valley expecting to see hit and miss marginal, especially the north slopes of the Alaska Range and into parts of the Copper River Valley. And still we're looking at marginal conditions holding over the large part of southeast. And you'll see the next wave of weather moving into the western chain, bringing marginal weather in uh, from Kiska all the way out toward Attu Island. Uh, for your pass conditions then, in detail, uh, Anaktuvik and Attigan Pass look pretty good throughout the day, uh, zipping around to Lake Clark and Merrill Pass, VFR there, and for Rainy Pass, Windy Pass also expected to see VFR throughout your Wednesday. Isabel Pass may start a little bit lower, but uh, it's possible you might sneak out with VFR by the afternoon. Mentasta Pass looks to hold in marginal conditions really most of the day. Tanita Pass also looking to stay uh, marginal, especially through the pass area, but on the western side, don't be fooled, uh, VFR could be seen there around Cook Inlet most of the day, so don't get into the pass and get stuck. Portage Pass looking for marginal weather most of your afternoon, and Chilkoot and White Pass, as we saw, looks to be at least marginal through Wednesday, and there's a hint of IFR sneaking in there on Thursday, so things uh, may not be as, as good as, as they've been. Uh, freezing levels up around uh, the North Slope looking at anywhere from two to about 4,000 feet. There's a lot of warm air still there. In fact, uh, Utkiavik set a record high yesterday of around 36. Out across the central and western chain, levels holding between two and 4,000 feet. You'll see that uh, contour gets a little bit more narrow as we get across the northern Gulf. Levels as high as 6,000 feet across southern parts of southeast around the Dixon entrance. The surface freezing line really taking over most of the 49th state tomorrow afternoon. Icing potential, there's a lot of moisture there, and of course those levels have been dropping over the last week or so. We're looking at levels between about four and 5,000 feet across the west and over the chain. Uh, remember that uh, convection does imply uh, severe icing possibilities there, so stay out of the way of that if you see convection in the, reg in the region. Anywhere from two to about 6,000 feet across the central and southern parts of the interior down into the Kenai Peninsula, and looking at about four to 6,000 feet across parts of southeast. There is a lot of moisture out there, and again, that precipitation coming in may mitigate some of the icing hazards that we see. Our jet stream right now, of course, the fast-moving uh, river of air coming across the North Pacific has speeds anywhere from 135 to about 150 knots. The main core of that is diving southward into the uh, southern Gulf and then zipping northward again across the Pacific Northwest with a little bit of low pressure dragging in some south and southeasterlies across the south and western coast. Underneath that, uh, we see a pretty broad southerly flow anywhere from 10 to about 25 knots over the mainland, southeasterlies over southeast, as strong as 50 knots across the central parts of the Panhandle and west and southwesterlies coming across the central and western chain anywhere from 40 to about 50 knots. 3,000 feet of broad southeasterly flow, a little bit more of a southeasterly bend here. Easterly is going a little bit of a brisk scale across the central and eastern Beaufort Sea Coast, 15 to 20. And again, much stronger flow across the central and western chain, anywhere from 50 to 65 knots. So that's where we find potential for severe turbulence anywhere from about four to 6,000 feet across the uh, Aleutians with a threat for convection throughout the day. Also some chop across the Brooks Range, mainly below 4,000 feet.
Hello again, I'm meteorologist Dave Snyder with the National Weather Service for another edition of Alaska Weather Facts. And joining us again, talking about the augmented reality sandbox, is Eric Stevens from GINA, the Geographic Information Network of Alaska. And he's actually talking about a project from EPSCOR, which is the Experimental Program to Stimulate Competitive Research. A lot of acronyms, but some really mm -hmm. fun stuff today, right, Eric? You bet. We've got a learning tool that is a tool that's fun to use, uh -huh. and it really has a, a relevance to actually daily lives of anyone who goes outside uh -huh. and sees uh, lumpy topography in Alaska. We've got yes. a lot of mountains and such. You know, when I was younger and go on your first hike in the hills, say, yeah. you're given, maybe you're in the Boy Scouts, or, or you get at the kiosk at, a, at the trailhead, a topographic map, a flat piece of paper yes. with all these lines on it, bullseyes, uh, long lines that curve back mm -hmm. on themselves, say, perhaps things that look like this. Mm -hmm. Um, a, a quadrangle or a topographic map. We've got here just to illustrate a couple of examples near Denali. Alaska okay. has so much Perfect topography, example. so many mountains. Yeah. And what are all these lines that we see? It can be tough mm -hmm. to know what this means the oh, first yeah. time you look at it. What we've got, all these lines represent lines of where the, uh, the elevation of the topography goes through a certain level above sea level, say, mm -hmm. that this line represents where the mountains have gone from below 1,000 feet mean sea level up through a thousand feet and above. That's your thousand foot contour. And when the mountain keeps going up, mm -hmm. you're up to 1,200 feet, 1,400 feet, and so on. And that's how you get this little bullseye around, around the peak of a mountain. Kind of makes layered slices, right? Kind of like layered slices. Okay. Nice way yeah. to look yeah. at that. And when you see those, the lines are closer together, you're, you're going up more steeply. Okay. If the mountain rises more slowly, it takes you longer in horizontal space to go through those different vertical increments. So that is that, really hard to visualize. Right. We're, imagine you're looking at a 2D piece of paper, two-dimensional yeah. piece of paper, but you're trying to understand what the three-dimensional world looks yeah. like. Yeah. Well, enter you know, the augmented help. reality I like it. sandbox. Okay. Yes, what is that? Yeah. It is right here. We have the sandbox with us today, Sandbox 2.0, portable version. Sweet. Built up at University of Alaska Fairbanks. And we've got a couple of folks helping out today. Yeah, uh, let's see, Alana Velaji, and she's a uh, mechanical engineering student from the University of Alaska Fairbanks. If you want to give us a thumbs up there, Alana, thanks for helping us out today. And Courtney Brees, she's the outreach coordinator from EPSCOR, also helping us out today. Thanks, Courtney. And this tool here has a Microsoft Connect um, to sense the level of sand in this sandbox, oh, wow. and then the yeah. Connect feeds its information into a computer that then sends a signal to a projector okay. to draw the appropriate topographic lines on this topography. The fun thing about this, as we can see here, wow, that. is that the sandbox and its Connect and its projector, they all work as a team. Hmm. So here we've got a mountain in the middle of the, of the uh, sandbox. What if we uh, took down the mountain to some degree Watch as the, uh, the software responds and redraws the topography. Mm, kind of a caldera forming there. There you go, yeah. yeah. <laughs> and what's fun about the sandbox, too, is it knows that uh, gravity flows downhill. Okay. And we've got some water that's actually down in the lowest elevations. And what's happening now is we're making it rain a little bit. We'll fill up rain oh, wow. into that uh, elevated lake bed, that caldera, as you uh -huh. said. And so now water is pooled up there. And if, what if you gouged out an outlet uh -oh. channel? Glacial dam release. There you go. The water flows out. What we're seeing here is a tool mm. that allows people to touch and connect, uh, Microsoft Connect, right. RRR, yeah. um, to connect two-dimensional topographic maps like what we have here, these flat things on a piece, wow. on a piece of paper, to the real three-dimensional world. I mm -hmm. think this sandbox, it's sandbox's real particular application as a learning tool to young people is what does a two-dimensional map mean when it's trying to represent the three-dimensional world? Right. This sandbox is kind of both at once. It's actually three-dimensional, uh -huh. a lumpy topography there, the sand, but it's got these lines drawn on the three-dimensional sand that would be on a two-dimensional right. piece right. of paper. Wow, that, I mean, that, that is a huge leap from the learning that we experienced when we were younger to how, mm -hmm. how children and even adults are visualizing in, in these new forms of technology it allows that to kind of reshape their thinking and visualize this in a, in a very useful and absolutely hands-on way. It's, it's, it's amazing. It's a hands-on tool. And it's hard for me to sit here and not go play with that. <laughs> well, that's what happened at GINA, um, up at the University of Alaska in Fairbanks, when the first model was being made, the prototype with right. plywood and such, we had professional adult 
<laughs> professor types had heard about this and they yeah. came by because they wanted to see how it worked. Okay. And, and everyone becomes uh, that idealistic, wonder-filled youngster. Sure. And, and you, you just can't help but play with that and to see how it reacts in time and, and um, right. it, it's a dynamic learning tool. And it Dynamic. responds. That's exactly. That's exactly mm -hmm. the word. Yeah. And you know, you wonder okay. what applicabilities beyond a teaching right. tool for Where topography it can it have? You can see how in Alaska we have inundation mapping is an okay. issue. If you had water coastal slosh, mm -hmm. slosh inland, say in a coastal flooding event right. on the western coast of Alaska or mm -hmm. the Arctic coast, you could see this. The concept is illustrated here um, as an introductory learning method. I think this is a potentially good outreach tool for all of us in Alaska. Okay, so not only just a topographical sense, a, a mapping sense, maybe something that leads into understanding of how geographic information systems work with GIS, but mm -hmm. also geology, if we wanted to get into kind of the formations and the bigger land masses and, and the representation of the 2D map, uh, we could go into hydrology, uh, which is uh, very important in Alaska, of course. Um, and even just understanding the weather sense, mounding up a big pile of sand could be that Arctic high pressure system sitting on top of Fairbanks and the voids mm -hmm. would be low pressure systems. This can go a lot of different directions. Mm -hmm. Yes, exactly. Wow. It's uh, not just landforms, but pressure has contours of high pressure and low pressure. And I wish I had had this kind of a learning tool no when I was taking kidding. Meteorology 101 back 25 years oh, ago. Wow. It would have been helpful, I think. Probably would have gotten a better grade. Yeah. <laughs> okay, thank you so much for coming by, Eric and Alana and Courtney. Thank you so much for your help there in the sandbox. We are going to play in the sandbox a little bit more coming up tomorrow on our next edition of Alaska Weather Facts. We hope you join us for that. In the meantime, make sure you go to alaska.edu slash E-P-S-C-O-R. That's alaska.edu. EPSCOR to learn more information about what we're doing with this augmented reality sandbox around Alaska. We'll see you next time on Alaska Weather Facts. And now, marine weather around Alaska. And back with your sea ice analysis for today, the 15th of October, we notice new ice growing across the marginal ice zone that is slowly working its way southward. But as you'll also see, uh, we're it's a little hard to see in this map actually, but uh, you can see that on the ice analysis from uh, the Alaska Sea Ice Program online, uh, areas of bays and uh, some of the lagoons right along the coast are starting to see new ice growth. So as things are getting colder and the winds are settling down in certain places, we're getting some of that new ice growing. I expect more of that, but uh, probably as far as larger zones of ice, we would expect to see that coming out of the eastern Beaufort, especially with a stronger easterly flow. Some of that could be advecting or moving into the central and eastern Beaufort seacoast as we go through the next couple days. As we look at Wednesday's marine forecast in southeast, expect a southeasterly flow across the outer coast, 20 to 25, with seas holding around 11 to 14 feet. Stronger northerly winds pushing in colder air for places like Haines and Skagway. A northeasterly flow for the Stevens Passage area. Anywhere from about four to six foot seas on the inside as we get into your Thursday. Not a huge change uh, across the inside passage. For, for the outer coast, anywhere from 20 to 25 moving ashore, uh, looks like most areas, 20, 12 to 18 foot seas, I should say, with a southeasterly flow on the inside, holding at 20 knots, 4 to 7 foot seas there, and northerlies continue in the Lynn Canal, 15 knots and 3 foot seas for you. For south central, Cook Inlet, north and northeasterly winds coming down, a 10 to 15 knot flow there, 3 to 4 foot seas expected, and with a southwesterly flow moving up toward Prince William Sound and Hitchinbrook entrance, northeasterlies light on the inside, 10 knots and 2 foot seas, northwesterlies a little stronger. Across the eastern Barrens with a 9 foot sea on Wednesday, diminishing to 8 feet and still blowing at 20 knots there from the north and west on Thursday. Light northerlies inside of Prince William Sound. East and north winds across the northern Gulf, 15 to 20 with 6 to 11 foot seas and winds generally stay light across Cook Inlet, 10 to 15 for your Thursday. Here's where a lot of the high winds are. As we look into Wednesday, you can see stronger westerly winds coming in, 35 to 60 knots there outside of Bristol Bay and down the Alaska Peninsula coastline there with uh, hurricane force winds in some areas, especially out to sea. We're looking at seas up to 37 feet. Uh, you can see how that drops off right off next to the coastline, but uh, again, it is going to be a very dangerous day out at sea across the Bering. And for that matter, some parts of the north and western Gulf with storm force winds there, 35 to 50 knots coming down the coast, 24 foot seas as you get past Sand Point to False Pass 
for your Wednesday. A lot of improvement as winds and seas diminish on Thursday. Still looking at strong westerlies 25 to 35 and about 30 to 35 across the north and western Gulf. 17 to 19 foot seas there, 10 to 23 foot seas across the southern and eastern Bering Sea for Thursday. Again, very stormy conditions here across the southern Bering as we get into Wednesday. 40 to 45 knot winds in the west, but for the central and eastern chain, anywhere from 40 to 60 knot winds as we get into your afternoon. Uh, the strongest of which will be right across the southern coast of the Bering with seas anywhere from 26 to 37 feet. And hurricane force wind warnings are in effect there out at sea. And you're looking at 23 to 27 foot seas south of the chain. So all areas affected by the remnants of what once was uh, Typhoon Hagibis. Now out across the west, south and westerly winds will work through the region on Thursday. We look to see diminishing winds in all areas and diminishing seas will follow, of course. 17 to 21 foot seas north of Nikolsky to Unalaska and about 13 to foot, 15 foot seas there south of the chain. All areas looking at about 30 to 35 knots, but look at the disturbed seas out here across the Bering. Uh, the green areas indicate seas over 20 feet in most areas and that's a huge improvement from where we will have been on Wednesday tomorrow. A strong westerly wind working over St. Paul and St. George on Wednesday, 60 knots with 31 foot seas. Hurricane force uh, wind warnings are out in effect there with a high wind warning for St. Paul and St. George. Offshore winds blowing out of Norton Sound and over St. Lawrence Island, 20 knots with three foot seas on the inside of the sound, 12 foot seas on the outside. On Thursday, winds diminish north and easterly winds continue with northwesterlies around the Kuskokwim Delta, 25 knots and 11 foot seas. Strong westerlies over St. Paul and St. George, but half as much as what you'll see on Wednesday. Seas there down to 19 feet on Thursday, so improving. Beaufort Seacoast looking at strong easterlies, brisk winds with 8 to 11 foot seas there on Wednesday. Offshore winds down the Chukchi, 20 to 25, 6 to 7 foot seas there for Wednesday. And that continues to slow down as we get into Thursday, 15 to 20 with 4 to 6 foot seas. Easterlies going over the Beaufort, 25 to 30 with 10 to 11 foot seas as we go through your Thursday. Recapping tonight's weather, once again a high wind warning in effect for the overnight hours around the Privlofs into Tomorrow afternoon, gusts up to 80 miles an hour. There are flood advisories for southern parts of southeast, specifically Ketchikan and around Ward Lake as rain continues to fall in moderate to occasionally heavy fashion. Unsettled weather will continue across the Bering. The high winds will settle out as we get into Wednesday night and into Thursday, but all that weather kind of stays in the same old spot as we go toward the end of the week. Uh, generally drier weather for the west coast by Thursday and Friday. These forecasts are for planning purposes only. Call 1-800-WX-BRIEF for a formal pre-flight briefing. Always file a flight plan before you go fly. The U.S. Coast Guard Auxiliary urges you to leave a float plan with a friend or the harbor master before you go boating.